Okay, today we're going to expand on our understanding of genetic variability. Um, for the first couple of minutes, I'm going to review um, a couple of concepts that we reviewed last time. So mutation, again, is a process that changes the DNA sequence. It can be inherited or acquired. If it's acquired, it could be um, due to the natural mistakes that happen during DNA replication. It could also be induced by the environment. The significance of a mutation or a change in the nucleotide sequence will depend on the type of mutation. It will depend on the location, right? For our purposes, Deletions, duplications, insertions, and translocations um, will be considered structural changes in the chromosomes. And we're going to talk more about that today. As we go through these, consider um, what the effect would be on gene expression. So if you had a point mutation, just a substitution of a nucleotide, right? It could have big effects, it could have no effects. If you have a huge deletion in a protein coding region, it's probably going to have significant effects. As a reminder, polymorphism describes um, two or more versions or alleles that are present in more than 1% of the population. So the difference between a mutation and a polymorphism is, is just the uh, frequency that it occurs. So a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP, is a single base pair difference, a point mutation. That's common. And when you look at a lot of the genetic research that um, has come out and that has been funded, a lot of that research focuses on SNPs, single nucleotide changes in our entire genome, and they are looking at how we can use those single nucleotide changes to differentiate different populations in the world. Given the fact that these single nucleotide changes often happen in places um, where it's inconsequential, it's going to become really silly to think that one nucleotide difference is going to um, differentiate different populations throughout the world. But of course, these single nucleotide differences um, have different effects depending on where they are, right? So they could be in a coding um, region of the gene, they could be on a non-coding region of the gene, it could be in a regulatory, in a switch region, or they could be outside of both and have no effect. SNPs are pretty common, so the average person will have about 3, millions of, 3 million of these. So moving on to the new content, um, structural variants. Again, these are deletions, insertions, duplications, translocations, not simple point mutations. So there's different nomenclature that you don't have to memorize. The nomenclature is based on the size of the structural variant. So if we are talking about only one to six base pairs and those either repeat or um, they're deleted, then that's a microsatellite. And actually 3% of our genome are microsatellites. Copy number variants, which we will talk about more are stretches of DNA at least a thousand base pairs. Um, and they actually extend up to several million base pairs. And that's either deleted or present in multiple copies. So think of the effects on gene expression. If you have stretches of DNA that is repeated over and over and over, Think of, the, think of what those effects would be. Um, you no longer have only two alleles for each gene. So let's say that these large stretches of repeating sequences are actually genes and they're just 
several genes in the same chromosome repeated over and over and over because that's actually pretty common. Then again, um, inheritance is going to be, um, or the inherited pattern is going to be really hard to predict because one person has numerous alleles on the same chromosome. So this really um, negates the dogma of every person having only two alleles, right? So this increases our complexity. Cystic fibrosis, we talked about last time. There are more than a thousand different variations or alleles of this gene that have been identified in people with CF, but the most common abnormality is a three-base deletion. So we are talking about a microsatellite, right? And it has significant effects. Copy number variants. So 10% of our genome actually consists of copy number variants. These are very large. The average size of a copy number variant is about 10 times the average gene size. And many are polymorphisms, which means they're relatively common. The other important um, characteristic of copy number variants is that they have really, really high mutation rates. So looking at mice um, developing, even after only a few cellular divisions, the researchers have been able to identify mutation rates from 100 to 10,000 times greater um, than what you would see in um, the rest of your DNA. So even in um, embryologic studies, after a few cell divisions, um, there is a gain or loss of millions of base pairs. So think of that. Um, later on, we are going to talk about twin studies because a lot of our um, understanding of genetics and inheritance is based on twin studies. But think of the effect that our knowledge of copy number variants has on this. If only after a few cell divisions, you can see millions of base pairs being either duplicated or lost, then even identical twins who start off with the same DNA are going to be different really fast. And studies have um, shown this to be correct. Whenever they sample cells from identical twins and they are um, adults, they find that there's about 10% variation for a twin pair. So there are numerous diseases associated with copy number variants, but it also these also play an evolutionary role. Um, and one study even found them to be relatively protective against HIV and AIDS. Um, if you know that yourself or a friend has this copy number variant, please still wear a condom because relatively protective is not completely protective. So why does this matter? Um, well, it kind of blows the dogma out of the water, right? We do not have only two alleles for every gene. Also, identical twins do not have identical DNA. And this is only based on our knowledge of copy number variants. Also, all cells do not contain identical DNA. Because you have copy number variants in all of your cells, but they will mutate at different rates and in different places. So on a test, if you are asked, um, what is the difference between a heart cell and a um, liver cell? Yes, you, are, you will still answer that they have identical genomes. The genetics are identical, but the epigenetics are different. That should still be your answer on a test, but we know um, that that's not actually true. Humans are actually mosaics. 
Williams syndrome is um, an example of a syndrome that occurs when about 26 to 28 genes are deleted on chromosome 7. So this would be considered um, a pathologic variant of a copy number variant. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because you're going to read about it and you're going to uh, watch a video. So we'll move on to aneuploidy. This is any variation in the number of chromosomes. So we were talking about structural variant. Now we're talking about numerical variants. Um, most of you are probably familiar with one form of aneuploidy, which is trisomy 21. Um, there are a couple of other um, diseases that are characterized by aneuploidy, but despite this association with um, pathogenesis, there is actually a surprisingly high degree of germline and somatic chromosomal mosaicisms in healthy individuals. So we all have a um, significant amount of aneuploidy within ourselves. So two to five percent of sperm, you will see this, um, and it's not necessarily every chromosome, and it's not um, the same degree of aneuploidy in each cell that is um, characterized by aneuploidy. Some might have, uh, some might be missing a chromosome, and some might have an extra one. And the rates of this in sperm are affected by behavior and environmental exposures. So more caffeine, more alcohol, more drugs, more smoking, more aneuploidy. In women, the rates are even higher. So about a quarter of oocytes in healthy females show some degree of aneuploidy. Um, and those aren't the only cells in our body that have this um, phenomenon. So it's actually pretty common in our brain. So about 10% of neural cells in a normal, healthy adult brain will have um, a degree of aneuploidy. And again, it's not necessarily the same um, duplication or missing chromosome, but um, the particular chromosome that is affected might have an impact on um, how pathologic the aneuploidy is. For example, if um, chromosome 21 is involved, whether it's missing or whether um, there's more than um, two, there's an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so why does this matter? One, it goes to show that we are, again, mosaics. Um, we do not have the same genetic sequence in every cell of our body. The other important thing is, again, that identical twins won't have identical DNA. So even from um, embryology, like even in utero, they're getting rapid mutations in the copy number variants. And then as they grow, we also see that they have 10% of their brain cells um, characterized by aneuploidy. And again, it's not the same um, genetic abnormality in each cell. This is particularly important because a lot of genetic studies um, that are trying to predict patterns of inheritance are looking at things like mental illness, um, criminality, behavior, sexuality. Um, and so, and you also have to understand that when they collect cells for these genetic tests to sequence um, the DNA, they are either taking cheek swaps or they are taking blood cells. Um, and that doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you're studying phenomenon that happens in the brain because you know that your brain cells are going to have a different nucleotide sequence in at least 10% of them. 